Um, my name is Alana Bratton, and I'm uh, president of the New Mexico chapter of the National New Deal Preservation Association. We have a wonderful website, which I'd like to direct you to. I believe we have cards with the website on the table in the back, as well as things you might want to take for purchase. We also accept donations. This is supported by a grant that we got from the New Mexico Humanities Council. Um, and we're very excited tonight to have a really exciting speaker. But before I get to introducing him, I would just like our board members to please stand. Um, if you would stand, if you're on the board. And Kathy Flynn is in the back. Oh, Kathy, you didn't have to stand. <laughs> And then we've got our um, jack of all trades and always there to help in the pinch. And that's Brad McKee, and he's going to stand up there and keep things going. So, to this afternoon's presentation is particularly interesting to me because I was the librarian at the Santa Fe Indian School uh, for 30 years. And so, this topic, Indians in the New Deal, is really a very interesting topic for me because I keep coming across some of the Indian school artists who got their, um, their start and their training at that time under the New Deal. So let me introduce um, Dr. Hendricks, who is presently the State Archives Administrator. He was, a, a, before that, he was State Historian from 2010 to 2019. I would come across him in the hallway when I worked as the Tribal Libraries Program Coordinator at the State. We were in the same building. He got his BA from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, his PhD from the University of New Mexico, and he also studied history of Spain in the Americas at the Universidad de Sevilla. He's a former editor of the Vargas Project at the University of New Mexico. And after concluding that project, he worked at the New Mexico State University on the Durango Microfilm Project, helping to produce and edit a 1,400-page guide to the collection. At NMSU, Rick also taught courses in colonial Latin America and Mexican history, and has written extensively on the history of the American Southwest and Mexico. He has written, co-written, and co-edited more than 20 books. His most recent book, which is very exciting to me, and it really filled a very important niche for our students at the Indian School, Pueblo Indian Sovereignty, Land and Water in New Mexico and Texas. That's uh, published by uh, University of Oklahoma and Norman. He co-authored and has been co-writing with Malcolm Elbrick, a new book coming out on Pablo Beta, who is a really, really significant Pueblo leader, and I really look forward to the uh, publishing of that book, which should be very soon. So let me introduce our speaker today, Indians in the New Deal, Rick Hendricks. Good afternoon, folks. Um, I'm going to start by telling you that my parents would be very happy to know that I was giving the fireside chat. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in a household where Franklin Delano Roosevelt was the greatest man who ever lived. And my mother stood by the train side when the train was on the way to Warm Spring, Georgia, carrying her body, so. Uh, I think they would be rather pleased. So, my topic today is actually slightly different from what Alana said. It's the Indian New Deal rather than Indians in the New Deal. Um, I rather suspect that most of you who are familiar with uh, the Indian art scene know about how the, the New Deal um, benefited or didn't benefit uh, Native peoples. The Indian New Deal is a part of the, the history of the New Deal, which is um, not nearly as well known. Um, it's really more uh, legal history and social history, um, which is really more what I do. I'm not an art historian. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, the Indian New Deal. And to do that, I want to give some background, actually quite a bit of background about how we managed to get to an Indian New Deal. Um, is this clear enough for you to read what it says? We're, we're trying to work on that. Um, anyway, this is a fairly typical cartoon from the um, late 19th century. Um, if, if you remember that uh, the Battle of the Little Bighorn and the Master of Custer's Troops is only 1876, so it's not that far removed from uh, a very negative attitude toward Native people. And this is sort of the idea that um, uh, we're going to remove the Indians from um, their benighted lives um, and they're going to be brought into the mainstream of U.S. culture, um, whether they like it or not, whether they have to be beaten into them. Um, and so that, this is a fairly typical cartoon of that era, late 19th century. This was a period when what came to dominate were assimilationist policies. And I'll just kind of go through these. Um, many of you know from the time of the English colonies, there were constant treaties that were made, hundreds of treaties. Um, in 1871, Congress passes a law, and after that point, there will be no more treaties made. So that, that whole relationship between, um, I mean, we think now of uh, a nation-to-nation -nation relationship as characterizing uh, the U.S. government relationship with, say, uh, of tribes uh, all across the country. Um, that has a very long tradition. Um, but in 1871, that was stopped. In 1883, there's a ban on traditional custom and ceremony. Um, again, the idea of uh, killing off uh, native tradition, native customs, um, and ceremony. So in, in New Mexico, that would mean uh, no more dancing in the pueblos. And, um, the whole idea of dancing becomes a very controversial topic. Um, and whether or not it's an expression of religion or is it somehow an expression of traditional custom and, and not interwoven in a religion. And the sort of basic concept is can, can you separate uh, religion from the everyday life of native peoples um, in the way that we think of in the Western world, where you have uh, we have a religion and then we have something separate, and then uh, whether or not that even made any sense in, in the native way of seeing the world. In 1887, and I'll discuss this more lately, um, comes the the Dawes Act and the privatization of reservation land. So, first, the idea had been to gather native peoples, put them on generally um, poor quality land um, in very reduced, often areas that they were not accustomed to living on, try to turn them into agriculturalists on um, very poor land, and then to issue, instead of communal plots of land, to issue, issue individual parcels of land to individual uh, heads of household. So to do away with the whole idea of common ownership of land. And then in 1898, the abolition of tribal government. And of course, here in New Mexico, um, from the imposition of the Spanish form of tribal government, um, early in the 17th century, probably around 1720s, there already was a very well-established um, tribal government system here um, in 1898. Those are good. And of course, the other thing, this is a topic that's very much in the news now um, with the, uh, the activities of uh, Deb Holland and uh, the discovery of burials, etc., cetera, um, boarding schools for Native children. So this is all, these were all assimilationist policies. 
um, that are characteristic of the end of the 19th century and on in. So when we get into the 20th century, normally we think of, say, the late 19th century or certainly from 1900 to 1920 is what's called a progressive era, right? Um, and then it, that improved a, a lot of different sort of progressive ideas in society. But the idea of um, treating um, native peoples um, sort of was missed by the progressive era. That, that somehow they didn't pick up on that. So um, in that period, writers and artists uh, were not really focused on that. That comes later. Oops, what happened here? Okay, so the General Allotment Act, also called the Dawes Act of 1877, this is Senator Henry Dawes of Massachusetts. This was the idea that I just briefly talked about that um, communal lands would be divided up um, and issued to individual heads of household. Um, and so what the other thing that would happen would be this would generally reduce the amount of land that had been available to Native peoples and make more land available to anyone else who wanted to get it. And so what happens with the passing of the General Allotment Act is you get these land brushes um, when the other land becomes available so here's, here's a couple of examples of, of posters for land uh, rushes. Um, probably the most famous um, is uh, in Indian Territory, Oklahoma, but also here's one for Iowa, Nebraska, lands that become available because of the Dawes Act. I mean, people can rush in and, and claim it. So literally millions of acres that are um, supposed to belong uh, uh, under the reservation system um, are lost um, as a result of that legislation. So another thing that happens is the establishment of Indian schools. And we have a number of, of Indian schools uh, here in New Mexico. Probably nationwide, the one that's best known is Carlisle in Pennsylvania. Um, there was also Hampton Institute. Um, Albuquerque Indian School, first established um, in 1881 in uh, Duran area of Albuquerque, didn't move, but relocates. But it was, um, as was Carlisle, it was established on a military model. So you can see the students there, they're in uniform, um, it very highly regimented. Um, part of the concept was that. Um, you would no longer be able to speak your native language. Um, you would not be able to follow any traditional customs. Um, and so we had um, this going on here. One of the big issues is that um, the schools tried to keep the students um, from returning to, in, in, in the case of primarily the Pueblos, so they wouldn't be available to return for feast days. They wouldn't be available to return in the summertime to help with agricultural labor. And of course, the idea was if you could keep them away from returning on the feast days, then they couldn't get the training that they needed to carry out the traditions, etc. So it was sort of an all encompassing way to uh, remove their Indianness from them. There was also the Indian Industrial School um, in Bernalillo. Um, the teaching staff at the Indian Industrial School were all Sisters of Loretto. This is often referred to as the Sisters of Loretto um, School in Bernalillo, but actually they were just the staff. Um, again, these all are operating at roughly the same period of time. And then probably Certainly for those of us in Santa Fe, the one that we know the best is St. Catherine. Um, St. Catherine Indian School. Um, and of course, just as a side note, the story of St. Catherine is a little bit confusing because St. Catherine, is, the school was named after St. Catherine of Siena, but the primary 
benefactors of the school was Catherine Drexel, um, who was Catherine with a C, and then when she founded her order in 1891, it became Mother Catherine. She spells it with a K. Um, so, and then now she is Saint Catherine with a K. Um, but she, for many, many years, provided um, the bulk of the financing that kept the school going. Um, and of course, this building is still in existence, although it's in very sad state of repair. Now, the situation with land in New Mexico um, was characterized by the 1920s as a situation where non-native people were encroaching on um, native lands and were in fact squatting and claiming the land. This was happening um, all over New Mexico. And so Holm Burson of New Mexico decided that he would solve this problem with the Burson Bill. Um, and you see it, this is a delegation of Pueblo leaders who have gone to Washington to testify against and protest the Burson Bill. And the Burson Bill was going to solve the land tenancy problem in New Mexico with Indian land by saying that non-native squatters who could put forth a claim to land um, if they had occupied that land for 10 years, irrespective of whether they had title to it or anything else, um, they would be entitled to then get clear title to that land. Okay, so 10 years of occupation. And this squatting on native land had gone back to the, the Spanish colonial period. Um, those of you who are familiar with the concept of the Pueblo League, the, the league of land that's given in, in the four directions to every Pueblo, came out, that concept in the Spanish colonial period came out of trying to deal with squatting on Indian land. So it's, it's a tradition that had been going on for hundreds of years. Um, and another feature of the bill would have been that this would have solved the situation as it was had the bill passed, um, and then New Mexico in the future would be empowered, empowered locally to settle any future land disputes. So this was going to provide the solution. Well, this really ginned up a lot of activity um, against this bill and really focused the attention of the intelligentsia on the East Coast in particular um, and artists um, to the plight of um, Native peoples, um, specifically in New Mexico, but also generally. Um, so, I want to talk a little bit about John Collier, because most of what I'm going to be talking about, the Indian New Deal is really John Collier's baby. He's the, really the one who came up with it. So in the 19, so John Collier was born in Atlanta, Georgia. He was educated at um, Columbia University and also in France. Um, and in the 1920s, he came to Taos and he moved in the circle with Mabel Dodge, Lujan, and all the uh, luminaries of the art world um, and literary world that were there. And he became very interested in um, the situation um, of Native peoples in New Mexico, and Native peoples in general. So in the 1920s, he co-founded an organization, uh, the uh, American Indian Defense Association, or sometimes just called the Indian Defense Association. Um, and the, the purpose of that organization was really to um, provide protection for Indian culture. And so one of the things that they did was, you know, they encouraged the study of Indian languages, etc. cetera. Um, uh, and, and so that, while he was the secretary of that organization, 
The Merriam Report came out in 1928. And the Merriam Report really was a damning criticism of the whole mindset of assimilation and all the policies that had been attempted uh, with respect to Native people um, in, in the United States. And among the things that it pointed out were the extreme poverty of Indian reservations as compared to all of the rest of the country. Of course, we're one year away from the Great Depression, um, but in 1928, the, if the national per capita income is $1,350, and the native per capita income is $100. So this was really quite shocking, um, and it pointed to the complete failure of assimilation policy, um, everything that had been tried in Carlisle and all these other uh, places, the various institutions, trying to uh, take the savage out of the Indian, you know, kill the Indian, save the man, that kind of attitude um, that had been a total failure. Um, and this, this report was very, very influential um, for that reason. And this is John Collier. And so, Collier um, is able to, when FDR becomes president, Collier is able to tap into the, to the reform-mindedness of FDR, um, and he becomes FDR's uh, Commissioner of Indian Affairs. So, um, a very influential position. So, from 33 to 1945, he's in this position, um, and he is... The, the most important figure in terms of trying to transform the United States government policy with respect to the treatment of Native peoples. Um, and Collier is very much an idealist. He has his own idea of how things, how things ought to be done. Um, and so, uh, well, here, here he is with a, a delegation um, uh, Many, many delegations travel from tribes all over the country to Washington to testify um, about various different things. Um, and so the first thing that um, Collier is able to influence is the Johnson O'Malley Act of 1934. So he hasn't really been on the scene that long when he's able to do this. And this authorized the Department of the Interior to enter into contracts to address particular educational needs. And this was something that, that John Collier was particularly interested in. And so, instead of taking the kids and sending them off to boarding schools and not allowing them to return, this allowed for the um, arrangement for uh, educating people um, in the tribal locations. And so um, it dealt with all these different levels, on the tribal level, at the state level, the schools. They can make contracts with private organizations. Um, and of course, some of these are going to be uh, religious organizations. Some of them are not. But you, it really up, up changes. And uh, Collier also uh, encourages and hires anthropologists to go out and study native languages so that the languages can be taught in the schools. Um, a complete shift from what had been done prior to that. Um, and it provided some federal money uh, direct, directly for native education um, and, and for health care um, and for agricultural assistance programs. So all of these things um, in the, the Johnson O'Malley Act. So Collier's great idea um, was what was going to come to be known as the Indian Reorganization Act, the IRA, um, and he was going to deal with all of these issues that had come up and been pursued. And the first thing he wanted to do was end the allotment program. So there would be no more dividing up of communal tribal lands to individuals. 
Um, another idea was that he wanted to encourage tribes to adopt a constitution because in his, in his way of understanding, um, in order to, to function in the United States, he needed to have a constitution. And if these were going to be treated as um, individual nations and we were going to have a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, then they needed to have constitutions. And so they created a model constitution. Um, um, there was to be hiring preferences, um, so if the BIA had positions and they needed to fill them, then um, Native peoples were supposed to get um, hiring preference um, over non-Natives. Um, Establishing loan funds at low interest rates for uh, tribal development. Um, and then another really important thing was to allow the Department of the Interior to accept new trust land. So if the land was transferred to the federal government and held in trust for tribes, so it could not be alienated, um, this would allow them to acquire additional land. And for example, here in New Mexico, um, and of course this continues to this day because this is permitted, um, Tribes uh, did, in fact, acquire uh, through purchase additional land, um, and so the, the, the trust land, the reservation land, um, could could expand. Um, and then um, the promotion of tribal self-government. These were all um, Collier's goals for the Indian Reorganization Act. Of course, not everything that Collier wanted um, made it into the final version of the act, which is pretty typical for um, a visionary who is working with Congress. Um, the end result is not exactly what was intended. So what comes out is the Wheeler-Howard Act of 1934, which is still to this day referred to as the Indian Reorganization Act, but it didn't really include all the features um, in exactly the way that Collier had wanted them included in um, his uh, original idea. So, one of the things about the IRA, um, again, this Collier put forth this idea. But there was a lot of opposition among Native people in the country to this um, this, I, this idea that they all... And so you can see that initially almost a third of the 250 tribes rejected the act altogether. They, they, they didn't want to do it. Um, and then, of course, they were supposed to vote um, like any other uh, community, and um, 38,000, 97,000 eligible voters voted in the referendum, referendum to accept or reject the IRA. So this was the, the, the initial thing. So part of the reason that it was objectionable, and for example, here in our part of the world, um, the Navajos um, were strongly opposed to it, because remember, now we're talking, we're in the 1930s, we're in the Depression, and the Navajos, according to Collier and the people in Washington, the Department of Agriculture, they, they're running too many head of sheep. So it's doing two things it's driving the price down of sheep, and it's also, um, it's really hard on the land. Right? And so there are in the IRA mandatory livestock reductions. And so this is something the Navajos fought. And um, allow me to mention Pablo Abeta from Isleta Pueblo, who was probably the most prominent native spokesman um, in New Mexico, probably one of the most prominent in the whole country. He was opposed to certain aspects of this. <coughs> Um, and one of the, he was siding with the Navajo about their opposition to the livestock production. Another thing that in the original concept, as Collier put, put it forth, the tribes would have been 
completely independent of the federal government. They would have been individual nations. There would have been no federal control. And over time, it would have led to the winnowing away of the VIA. But in the legislation that passed, the tribes remained firmly under federal control. So a lot of them said, well, we don't, we're not going to support this. Another issue was that in any sort of ide idealistic way of looking at land tenancy, Collier thought that all native tribes want to hold land communally. But in fact, by the time this legislation was passed, there were many native tribes that had already um, developed private property on their holdings, including in, in New Mexico. So the idea that no, that they would basically have to turn the private land back in and it would be held communally um, was also something that they were not in favor. There was, the Congress was opposed to the concept of tribal autonomy. Of course, now we talk about <clears throat> tribal sovereignty, um, we talk about autonomy, we talk about nation-to-nation -nation relationships, but the Congress was very much opposed to that. And so one of the things it did, even though there were a lot of measures in the IRA that would be considered positive, um, Congress didn't approve significant funding for it. Um, and so a lot of things could only be put forward as sort of half measures or quarter measures that really weren't. Uh, and then, generally speaking, Native peoples in this country uh, at this time um, had a, just a distrust of the federal government. There had been too many broken treaties, um, too many um, agreements that had not been kept, promises that were not fulfilled, etc. Um, and so there was quite a bit of opposition to this. Now, one of the things that was um, a positive development um, was, and of course I know that many of you, especially uh, Kathy's, the, Kathy's probably the world's leading expert on the CCC. <laughs> Um, and I didn't know that there was a CCCID. Um, did the CCCID operate here, Kathy? The Indian CCC, or was it just the Plain CCC? I do not know. Okay. I haven't found any evidence, maybe somebody can tell me later, that we actually... Who got to? Pardon? I can tell you who got to. Okay. Um, I haven't found any evidence that we actually had a separate Indian CCC here. We certainly had a CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps, and this was really, really good for Native peoples all across the country. 85,000 Native people found employment in the CCC slash CCCID. Um, well, you can see in this particular community, which is not New Mexico, there is a CCC ID there. Um, but it provided a lot of employment, and the other thing that it provided, uh, again, we're in the 1930s, um, it provided a lot of very practical training. And so when, when the war breaks out, when we get involved in World War II, the, the training that these native people have been able to acquire through the CCC um, makes them able to contribute very directly to the war effort for those who stay here. Um, and of course, the native people, as they have always traditionally done, serve in the military. But because of what they, they were able to learn, they were able to plug that right in, and that was a that was a boon for them, um, and also for just the, the country in general. Yes, we did have these separate 
Okay, we'll save there. You learned something. It came back. Okay, we did have a separate one. Um, but also integrated, because we know of Pueblos yeah, yeah. that worked on the National Park building. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, yeah, yeah I, 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 I had gathered that, that it was not um, completely separate. But anyway, so exactly. we did have one. Here's some folks building the wall, uh, some native folks building the wall. So, also, and this is the part that I'm not really uh, an expert on, um, but, and I know that many of you are, um, but part of this whole movement that Collier was doing and part of the Indian New Deal was the creation of the Indians, Indian Arts and Crafts Act of 1935. Now, my understanding is the board that was established because of the creation of this act, the board still exists. And so it created a system for authenticating products um, so that when you go to buy Native American uh, crafts, that um, you can be sure that the turquoise is made by Native, the, it's produced by Native Americans, not made in South Korea or wherever. Um, um, and then um, the system for enacting marketing practices and economic development. Now, the, the whole economic development piece was kind of a mixed bag. Um, this Indian Arts and Craft Act certainly benefited certain tribal peoples, but it didn't produce anything like the economic development that people thought it would and thought it might. And I want to stop this, conclude this part of what I want to say, and then I'm going to sort of give you a sort of a, an evaluation of the whole thing. Um, this is native government and constitutions and charters that, that came about as a result of all this movement in the 1930s. And so you can see in the eastern pueblos, we have. Well, I've got U Mountain U, which of course is not an eastern pueblo, but eastern location. So Santa Clara in 1935, the youths initially were opposed to it, and then you have Isleta Pueblo, not until 1947, and Laguna in 49. So you can say there was not really a bad rush here in New Mexico to go out and create a constitution based on what the uh, Indian Reorganization Act had come up with. And then you have Zuni and Hopi are early on, and it's interesting, Collier was over in Zuni and Hopi campaigning to try to get them to adopt constitutions. Um, and then you have Mescalera and Korea. And the Navajos still don't have a constitution. Um, what the Navajos have instead is the tribal code, Navajo tribal code. <laughs> and interestingly enough, it's really based on Collier's rules for a Navajo <coughs> tribal council. So, um, a, not an overwhelming adoption of the Indian Reorganization Act in New Mexico, and I think that. A big part of that is because we already had very well established tribal governments here in, in the Pueblos that was already hundreds of years old um, by the time this rolled around. Um, so, by way of advertisement, um, the, the book that uh, Malcolm Ebright and I have this coming out from Union Press probably early next year, we're thinking. The Life and Times of a Native Statesman of his letter, Pueblo, Pablo Aveta, 1871-1940. Um, a lot of his life and a lot of his activity was dedicated to the same kinds of things um, in terms of uh, preserving public traditional culture, the language, um, 
that the Collier was involved in, um, he and Collier were acquaintances. I don't know that they were really friends. They didn't agree on everything. Um, but um, his the, the bulk of his adult life, he was involved in a lot of those same issues. Um, so the Indian New Deal and John Collier, sort of a historian's assessment. Um, most scholars now consider that um, John Collier was um, was very much an idealist, um, and he had his own vision for what he thought the preservation of native culture would be, and it was through this Indian Reorganization Act and all those things that we've talked about, and the creation of constitutions, um, and actually, it didn't really do all it didn't do that. So. On the one hand, um, for a period of time, while Collier was alive, and he was active until 1945, and he lives into the, I think he dies in 1968, but for the period of time that Collier was active in the Roosevelt administration, most historians feel like that he was able to provide a reprieve against the onslaught of people who were trying to destroy native culture. But that as soon as the Roosevelt administration left, a lot of those efforts continued. Again, they came back. Uh, the Indian schools didn't go away. Um, a lot of them operated until much later. So very much a, a, a mixed mixed bag um, of what he hoped to accomplish, what he did accomplish. Um, certainly representative of um, a group of intellectuals and artists who came to the aid of the native peoples of this country in as, that, as a reaction to assimilationist policy, um, but not not entirely uh, not entirely successful. Um, so that's basically what I have about the Indian New Deal. I'd be happy to answer, try to answer questions if you have any. I just have one comment. Um, my understanding from the history of the women's club, and maybe Susan could address this too, is in some of the information I see, the Santa Fe Women's Club was very involved in the Marion Report. I don't know whether it was promoting it or encouraging it to happen or exactly what it was, but I remember looking in the history of this club that we're in right now. Yeah, I'm sure that it's true because the national organization of women's clubs was very involved. So the hope there was at that time, oh, I guess it probably still is a national organization of women's clubs, but they were very much involved in, in that whole issue. Which I think it's interesting to be having this conversation in this facility. Without a doubt. Kathy? Uh, there is a son of Collier living in his house, <coughs> Robin. Yep. Uh, and every time we've talked, he just tries to refer me to I know one of his brothers, because he said, I'm not even that stuff. <laughs> right. right. So, yeah, I mean, Robin, and for those of you who know Robin or don't know Robin, um, Robin is very active in uh, um, disseminating talks, right? I mean, right. He, he's, um, he records them, puts them on the radio. Um, and, uh, and you're right, he doesn't really like to talk about um, John Collier um, Sr. Yeah. Or even John Collier Jr. that much. <laughs> uh, John Collier Jr., of course. So John 
John Collier, the one that I've been talking about, was a trained sociologist. John Collier Jr. was one of the leading proponents of um, visual anthropology, I guess we would call it now. So, of uh, photographing um, people in their natural setting um, and then sort of studying anthropologically. So, uh, you know, a very outstanding and, and, a, and just a wonderful photographer. Um, so, that's the Colliers that we've been. Robin, I guess, lives in Taos or close by. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, where is the St. Catherine School building? Um, you know where the National Cemetery is? Here in Santa Fe? So it's uh, the property joins the National Cemetery. Um, it's kind of in a secluded neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, and um, somebody who knows the streets in Santa Fe better than I can tell you what street you need to go to to get. I think it's going to be Rio Grande. Yes, sir. Yeah, but it, it's fenced off, so yeah. I mean, you can't actually, you can't actually go onto the property now, and you wouldn't want to. I mean, I've I've toured it when I was on the cultural properties review committee, um, and I mean, it's probably the largest freestanding adobe building, certainly in the United States, back in the world. The, the main building, the one that I showed you in the illustration, it, it's a, it's an incredible. That is an incredible building, um, but this. The, the St. Catherine School has, by neglect, neglect is um, deteriorating. Um, there have been a lot of plans to, to try to do something with it, um, but it would cost millions and millions of dollars to, to do anything with it. And I, I guess it maybe is used occasionally for a movie set or something now. I don't, I don't even really know. I think the city owns it. Yeah. Um, well, the sisters did sell it to a private person, yeah. but any development effort that was made was rejected by the city. So I guess that's why. Well, the city yeah, that that whole thing came before the cultural properties for the community. That was uh, that was a very controversial situation. Yeah, but I think the city owns it now. Um, maybe the city housing or something or other. Anyway, um, you can. Get close enough to look at it, but you can't go on the grounds. Um. Another question? Yeah. Now, when was the BI incorporated into the Department of the Interior? When was it? In, well, I honestly don't know because when um, I've looked into the history of the the Bureau in, so for example, when they talk about Collier being the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, you'll also see him listed as being the head of the BIA. Um, I, I don't really know the, the when it comes to the, it's very early on in the 19th century when, when, it, when it's referred to as the BIA. Um, I don't know the day off the top of my head. But it's it's always been it's always been a part of it. I believe it just had a different. It hadn't always had the name Bureau of Indian Affairs. It's had a bunch of different names. But I think it's always been a part of it in terms of the people who were leading it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I actually have several questions, and I'll, I'll start with uh, what you're just talking about in terms of St. Catharines. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was sort of um, operating at the same time as the Santa Fe Indian School. Uh, I was wondering, this has to do with some interaction I had with a Native uh, person, I believe, from uh, okay, Wing Bay, who uh, was just really uh, you know, just talking about the horrors of St. Catherine. So I was wondering if you could comment on any differences in orientation, especially in the time period that you're referring to in your talk of the Santa Fe Indian School versus St. Catherine. The other question, since you mentioned that, that I was going to ask is a very interesting statistic in terms of the disparity in income, uh, per capita income nationally as well as in, uh, and, and the Native American population. Uh, so I'm just wondering, you know, was it, uh, 
like maybe a 15 or something. I, it was very, it was, uh, no, not even that. It was, uh, it was less, uh, any, anyway. Um, but I was wondering if, do you have any current statistics on, again, the uh, income and wealth of native populations versus the rest of the country? And then one other question, which is somewhat peripherally um, related, perhaps, and that is when you talk about uh, that there were many people who were opposed to reestablishing re a communal, a, a communal uh, framework for land, uh, I was wondering if it was people more in positions of wealth and having larger landholders who were perhaps the most opposed and had this capitalist ethos sort of permeated these, uh, you know, the whole tribal society or was it more or less uh, um, uh, propagated by those with substantial economic and land holdings? Okay. That's a lot. So let me take the first one. Let me yeah. take the first one first. Sure. Sorry. So the schools were. Um, so if, if we just look at, um, we'll we'll talk up a little bit about Albuquerque, Santa Fe Indian School, um, Bernalillo, Bernalillo Industrial, and Saint Catherine. Yeah. So okay. So they had. Quite different orientation, and the way they went about it was different. So, Albuquerque Indian School was military on the lines of, say, Carlisle in Pennsylvania. Everybody had a uniform. Um, you drilled. Uh, you had to have, you know, your hair was shorn and all that sort of stuff. It was very rigid. Um, some of the superintendents of the school were very reluctant to allow kids to leave. They wanted them to be there all the time. They didn't want them to go home, etc. Um, Santa Fe Union School was quite different. Um, the proximity of a lot of the pueblos to Santa Fe meant that the parents would come on the scene, um, want to visit with the kids. Um, so the, the interaction and I'm talking in sort of broad generality, the, the interaction was very different. The kids were much more likely to be able to go home uh, for ceremonial activities or for the summer um, just because the pueblos were, so many of them were so close by and the parents would, would come up. Um, so much so that the parents would come so frequently that it created a problem for the school because the parents would come and they would want to be with the kids. And, you know, and, they, and so they hadn't really thought to provide food for the visitors, etc. So that was very different. So Catherine um, was not on a military model at all. Um, uh, and it and Bernalillo were staffed by nuns. Okay, so the everything that you've probably heard about Catholic school um, and going to school with nuns, if those of you have had that experience. Um, I haven't, of course, but um, I hear that to be quite strict. Um, most of the people that I have interacted with at Santa Fe, that went, that went to Santa Fe Indian School or St. Catherine have reported that they had a wonderful experience, that they sometimes met their life partner there, etc. They were allowed to speak their languages, or, you know, at least to a certain, to certain extent. However, in recent years, there have started to be some stories come out about people who had a really bad experience, um, physical abuse, and various different things that I have heard, um, specifically about St. Catherine. Okay. Um, so I'm not really qualified to speak. I didn't, you know, I didn't go to school there or any of that stuff. But <laughs> it used to be that the stories were much more positive, um, and that. Now, um, there are people who are, maybe it's because they were traumatized or whatever, they didn't feel comfortable, but there have been some stories that have come out about people who attended there. Um, obviously, um, with the, the discovery of burials um, in Indian schools in various places, um, in the U.S. and Canada, there's a lot more attention focused on um, that kind of activity and what might be the 
explanation for that. Um, um, so, most of the scholarship that you will find about Indian boarding schools presents it as a very, very negative experience. Um, I can just say that Papo Aventa, um, he went to several different kinds of schools, including St. Mike's College, when it was basically a high school, but he also went to Albuquerque Indian School. Um, he reported it had been a good experience and he wanted his children to go. And so, um, I'm sort of chasing a rabbit here. The schools were different, the experience was different, and I think it's probably individualized, but I think overall, just the concept of taking children out of their culture, putting them in another culture, and trying to keep them from being associated with that, I think we would have to say that overall, generally speaking, that's got to be negative. I mean, that would be, if I had been sent to Culver Military Academy, which is where my parents wanted to see me uh, because I was a near do will. Um, I probably would have been grown up and been uh, dissociated from my culture, and I grew up in the Appalachian Mountains, and so I had a culture. Um, um, so I think it would have been bad, and I'm sure for for a while. But I've heard, and I've heard, you know, they were going to tear down facilities at the Indian School, and uh, they were actually people who came and talked to us at um, Cultural Properties Review Committee. Uh, we had no authority to intervene, but we listened to them. And they were in tears about um, the, the idea that some buildings would be taken down there because they had had such a wonderful experience there. Maybe some other family member would have had a horrible experience. I, you know, I, I, I wouldn't have liked it, and I wouldn't have wanted my children to have had that experience. But, okay, so that's your first question. <laughs> Um, I actually have no idea what you're saying. But what's the situation now? This is not good. <laughs> right, that's what I thought that I was just I don't I don't have any statistics. Yeah, I can promise you that I can promise you that it's still um, uh, I, I did have not all that long ago, I did have those figures and I was shocked at the income disparity. Yes. Um, just in New Mexico, if you think. Um, tribal communities in New Mexico and um, New Mexico per capita income, broadly speaking, wow. I think you would be, everybody in the room would be shocked. And then the last question was in terms of uh, the people that fought against the idea of oh, okay. re communalizing, but so to say, land ownership. Did those who had more land wealth and perhaps right. economic wealth, um, did they sort of lead the fight against yeah. their and, own And I would say that it, 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 the situation is too varied to generalize like that because yeah. some tribal communities had, as a practice, distributed land. And so that would, that would be a factor there. There might well have been, I don't know, if you were in Oklahoma and you had an oil well on your property and you were super prosperous, maybe you would really be opposed to giving that back into the tribe. But I, I don't think you could generalize that. It, but, and I thought you had four questions. I don't know. Was there one? That's fine. Does anybody else have a question? Does anybody else have a question? I have a comment. Yeah, sure. Uh, I went to a talk at Speech American Research about three years ago, and the gentleman had been doing research on the Louder. number of Hispanics, on the number of Hispanics that had uh, gone to uh, Indian schools, uh -huh. and I thought that was quite interesting yeah. that there would be a definite push by Hispanics to be included right. in education at any level. Basically. Right, right, and of course you mentioned your company. The the whole idea there was that. I think that my kids can get a really high quality education at this place. So I want them to be included. And, and I also, when I first encountered that, I thought that was quite interesting that there were um, quite a few, actually, non native people who were at some of the institutions. Um, um, because a lot of times that was the only real opportunity that there was, and the quality of 
imagination is probably pretty good. Um, so yeah, for sure, that was that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes sir. Oh. <laughs> He says I have to talk. Um, I don't want to talk too much. Indians are human beings like the rest of us. And so I think we don't look at some things about the story that we need to. My dad went to Saturday High School in the 20s. He met a Hopi Indian who was a little older and had come over here on his own from the Saturday Indian School. I uh, was wanted to be an artist, but this guy got so fed up with the way it was being run, he transferred himself to Santa Fe High. And my dad went and visited him in old age. He also knew a Taos Indian from the Albuquerque Indian School. I don't remember how, and we visited him once when I was a kid. And he wasn't allowed to live in the old Pueblo because he was a progressive. He had to live outside the Pueblo. Uh, and I've heard stories like that over and over and over around all these issues. And I will mention a poem everyone who should find and read. Skull of the Earth, written about 1902, about all the immigrants coming to America. And the language of that poem is no different from what was going on with the Indians. You're coming to America, you've got to grow up and become American. So I think it's a little bigger, broader subject than just these people. I also have a prison mate student from Isleta. We got to talk about all this one time. He's the only Pueblo in the pen for 19 Navajos. And this came up somehow and he said, he said, Taos Pueblo is going to last another 100 years. I said, why is it? Because they're so backward, all the leaders are 100 years old or 90 and, and they won't change. So, I'll stop. <laughs> well, I'm not really sure what your point is, well, but um, I, I will say this, that all communities, um, especially what we know of native communities, and the, the community that I have been working with now for the last few years is Zaleta, and the Pueblo is divided between progressive and conservatives, and it always has been. Um, I imagine that the little town that I came from in North Carolina probably also was, had a conservative and uh, more liberal, right? And there, it is the case that the per um, Charles Blumas is a name that many of you probably know. Um, he lived in his left Pueblo um, for a while. Uh, over the opposition of the conservative faction and a, an Indian who had gone to Carlisle and come back to the Pueblo, taught him the language and taught him cultural things that the conservatives didn't want him to know. And so the, that individual disappeared off the face of the earth. I had no idea what happened to him. Um, the Pueblo disavowed everything that Lomas wrote about the tradition and culture of his letters, and he had no idea what he was talking about. And there were people who didn't live in the Pueblo um, because of their experience um, in the outside world. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, that's characteristic of, I think, most most communities, um, especially sort of closed communities. And why did this um, the one point that I would say that I think that I would take issue with your comment, um, the Irish and the Italians and the Eastern Europeans came here and they were encouraged to assimilate. That's absolutely true. The Native American people were already here. Yeah. And, and to me, to me, that's a very fundamental difference. Nobody, nobody said to, that, you know, 
can, that, that to me, is, that's, that's the difference. And, and it's a very fundamental difference. It's not the same. Yes, Irish people were discriminated against, Italians, Eastern Europeans. The Jews, I hope that you're watching the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. of your, uh, if you haven't, please do watch it. Um, obviously, it's probably of all Ken Burns productions, it's the one that intentionally has the most resonance with what's happening today. I mean, that he has said clearly that he's doing that, he did that on purpose. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear echoes of what's happening today. Um, anyway, anybody else have a question? Yes. From a macro level, um, how would you characterize the impact of the New Deal on man populations versus, I mean, from my perspective, looking back historically, I think that the New Deal was probably very impactful for the large majority of the population in the United States at the time. Did it have the same level of impact? Or well, so, I mean, you can, we can point at certain things that there's no question that the New Deal had a positive impact. Uh, I mentioned that the 85,000 tribal people who had worked and, and learned skills and then applied those skills. One of the things that the CCC was doing all across the country was improving land. 50 million acres of tribal land was improved by the work of the CCC. 50 million acres. So, that's just one tiny little thing where there's no question that that New Deal program, as it was applied in Indian country, was a good thing. Um, I think overall, it's much more of a mixed bag, as it is all over, right? I mean, you can look at, oh, I don't know, in, in my part of the world, rural electrification that came about because of the New Deal. That was a great thing, but now we're looking at all the dams that the Tennessee Valley Authority put in and the problem that that has created now. So I, I think, you know, there's no question that, that there are pluses and minuses, and I think in Indian country that would be exactly the same. That, that would be my Yes, ma'am. But either one, actually, there are two. So, uh, okay. We'll go with the mask first. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, just a, another note on the Dawes Act. Um, I've forgotten the name of the book. Um, something at the Night of the Blood Moon. Blood Moon is the only. And they make reference in there to how the Osage Indians in Oklahoma were, you know, their economic status was completely decimated by the Dawes Act because they had, when the oil was originally discovered there, they did have, you know, mineral wealth. And then the Dawes Act, screwed them royally because the speculators would come in yeah. and buy the individual little parcels, of, yeah. the smaller parcels of land, and anyway. But yeah. of course, the Indians own all of us on the mail, so. Yeah, I was so happy to hear that. <laughs> the book was Killers of the Flower Moon. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Um, so, part of the importance of the CCC was the number of men who then went into the military, then went into the army in World War II. Now we know about the Navajo Code Talkers, mm -hmm. but they were I mean, they were a minor part of that 85,000. Do we know what happened generally with men, native men who were in the CCC? You mean how many of them went in? Right, service. I don't really know any numbers. The, the contribution that they made was twofold. One is that sometimes they learned to trade a skill that can be applied directly in the military, but sometimes it can also be applied in um, stateside work. Um, because not everybody would be fit to serve in the military or whatever, but they might still learn the skill that could be, I don't know, maybe they learned welding and they could work at a shipyard. So they serve both ways, and that's usually how it's described, is, is that, um, that um, they do mention code talkers, so there must really have been code talkers who were also CCC workers. I mean, it's always mentioned together, right? So 
But it wasn't just the people who went into the military, although some of them, you know, like if you had learned to be a mechanic, then there would be a place for you right away in the military fixing jeeps or something. But, but they learned other skills. And of course, it was, you know, primarily young, younger people that were um, healthy enough to do that kind of work. Um, but it, it was both. <coughs> Question? Go ahead. So, so I, you know, maybe just kind of a macro question or, you know, thinking about pros and cons, but what if, you know, you can go back and say you're in the position, you know, back in the Dawes, the Monks, and, you know, that era, the Axe, and say you were in that position, and I know you got to put yourself into that time and who's kind of pushing you to do certain things, but... What might you have done differently, or how would you have implemented some policies or done some different things that might have been maybe differently effective or more successful? What could you have done? Like a wish list of three things. <laughs> <laughs> or four. Oh. <laughs> Historical fiction. Um. Yeah, all can do. So. Um, you mean I'm in John Collier's shoes, or I'm, I'm uh, let's, okay, well, I'll, I'll tell you. Let's say I grew up exactly the same way in the 19, 1933. I'm 35 years old. I, uh, I have an eighth grade education. I have bad teeth, poor health. Um, I work 14 hours a day at a lumber mill. I'm not going to do anything. I mean, you're asking me, what would I do? I wouldn't, do, I wouldn't have been in that position. I didn't go to Columbia. I wouldn't have. Um, if I had been, my father's age, my father's parents were... Uh, Factory workers, right. so factory. About you right now, you're <laughs> in that position, right? <laughs> alternate, right? So I'm 66 years old, and I'm working for the federal government, and I've had the blessings of an education, and I've worked with Indian people for the last 40 years. Yeah, I, I would be right there with, uh, with John Collier. Okay. I mean, I've been blessed. I've worked with Indian people for my entire career. Mostly with lawyers trying to protect their land. So I'm pretty biased. Yeah, I guess I was also thinking earlier than the 1930s when they started, you know, they had some of So, Morrison, 1920s? Yeah, 1820s. I have no idea. I think, again, if I had the benefit of a good education, uh, same set of parents, probably. Uh, I, yeah, I think I'd still be there. I mean, it, it's hard to say. The, the intellectuals of this country and the artists of this country didn't really discover the plight of the Indians until the 1920s. They managed to miss that problem and they focused on other things. Right? That whole progressive area, 1890s to 1920, that wasn't really, not to say they weren't people at all, but in terms of it being really on the radar of all of the great writers and, and artists and intellectuals, it wasn't really on the radar at that point. Well, we had World War One. They, they had other. They were, you know, I mean, just in their... this was a. Um, yeah, it was. There were different things that were concerning people at that time, um, and uh, and and that, that really happens later on, um, and. You know, there's an interesting thing that happens. It's called the uh, the Indian dance controversy. 
and this is in the, in the 1920s, and a lot of it is focused on New Mexico. And so intellectuals in this country, and you know, anthropologists, people like that, who were used to studying culture, they started to look at the native peoples, and they started to say, so there were two groups of people, two ways of looking at things. One of them said, we can preserve native culture if we could find things on the basis of native religion, right? We can say when they dance, it's a religious expression. When they do whatever, you know, whatever cultural thing, language, they're, they're, they're speaking their language, they're singing, we can say that is an expression of native religion and therefore on the grounds of protecting religious freedom, we can make a case that we need to focus attention on that. So that was one strain among intellectuals beginning in the 20s. And you see that in the Indian dance controversy. Um, some people say, well, it's religious expression. Then you have other people who say, no, you can't separate any facet of native culture into the Western concept of religion. I touched on this briefly before. So, two very different ways of looking at what, and so they didn't talk about um, a Pueblo feast day and dancing as somehow a separate piece of religion, a separate piece of the culture, right? The way we tend to conceive of it in the Western world. For them, it was ceremonialism, and then everything was religion, or everything was part of the culture, you couldn't separate religion. And in my view, the Pueblo people that are conservative and are not, see a lot of, a lot of people, I mean, it used to be very popular anthropologists to talk about compartmentalization, and they would say, there's this like Indian part of your brain, and that's that's uh, traditional, and then there's this other part of your brain which is Catholic, because you grew up in, the, in this environment. And I used to wonder, how does that work? <laughs> <laughs> how, how do I have part of my being that is one thing, and one, and, and so, and it, I mean, it's not completely refuted, but you don't hear people talk too much about compartmentalization in the world. And to me, it's never made any sense. But it, that in, in our in Western culture, our lives are very compartmentalized, right? We have a political identity, right? That may or may not jive with our with our religious identity. And we have a religious identity that we associate with being Protestant or Catholic or Jewish or whatever, right? But if when you get up every morning and you pay from your pouch to second pocket and you dress the four cardinal directions, and for your entire day, um, that's how you started your day. Everything that happens that day is related to your relationship with the spiritual world. There is no separation. There is no religion to separate from the rest of your life. So that was a, something that was going on in the 1920s. That, you know, how do we bring this forward? How do we... And, and uh, I think in, in popular talk now when we talk about Pueblo religion or Apache religion or whatever. But there was a time when there was it was very much up in the air how that would be discussed. And um, and they weren't really asking the tribal people, you know, how do you conceive of the world? And probably they were people really none of your business. So that can, I can't answer your question about what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Kay. Uh, I was just wondering, like, to share uh, to the other subject that has been popping around, the CCC has been popping around. Uh, there is a brand new book that came out in 1998. And I hope somebody will help me with the author's name. But um, it's brand new, and it's the 
uh, the CC, the New Mexico CCC camp sites. Oh, Dirk Van Dyke. Dirk Van Dyke. Van, Van Hart. Van Hart. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. And we have interviewed him, and it is on our website, and uh, it is very, a very valuable document, I believe. Uh, and so some of the CCC things might be discussed in there that you might be interested in. And uh, the REA mentions. We also have interviewed recently the director of the REA, and he's given us the history of REA nationally and in New Mexico, and that is also on our website. So if you don't have our website, be sure to pick up a card that has it on there before you leave. And we have another program coming up on October the 16th uh, that is going to be about medieval artists. Uh, and you'll get a, a brochure about it as you walk out the door. Uh, we, if you have any other questions, please call us. It'll be here in the same location. But let's thank Rick for such a